We're looking again at the uh, Song of uh, Songs, uh, chapter 3, and we'll be looking at verses uh, 6, 6 through uh, um, 11. We had taken a look at this uh, last week, and, and this is a, an account of the, the wedding of Solomon. Uh, we had uh, read uh, earlier in the service a, a psalm about Solomon, and uh, now we read in the, the great blessing that Solomon is to his people and to the whole land. And now we uh, look at this account again of Solomon's wedding. Uh, this is God's word, eternally true, Song of Songs, right, chapter 3, beginning in verse 6. Who is this coming up from the desert like a column of smoke? perfumed with myrrh and incense, made from all the spices of the merchant. Look, it is Solomon's carriage, escorted by sixty warriors, the noblest of Israel, all of them wearing the sword, all experienced in battle, each with his sword at his side, prepared for the terrors of the night. King Solomon made for himself the carriage. He made it of wood from Lebanon. Its posts he made of silver, its base of gold. Its seat was upholstered with purple, its interior lovingly inlaid by the daughters of Jerusalem. Come out, you daughters of Zion, and look at King Solomon wearing the crown, the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, the day his heart rejoiced. Here ends our reading. We have a response of thankfulness that's printed for us uh, there in our bulletins, the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Thanks indeed. Let's pray. We see the idea here in this psalm is that the king is having this wedding. And last week we mentioned this uh, idea that we saw in the early 80s, if you are that old, uh, uh, that we saw when uh, Charles and Diana were married. And all this hoopla was made all over the world because we're uh, fixated um, like uh, Frankie Heck, perhaps, on the idea of somebody who's a commoner uh, getting married to a king. Imagine that uh, as um, uh, the, the idea that, that uh, one of us could be royalty. You know, you're just born into that normally. And what if that were true of you? And so this idea always takes us. It's the Cinderella uh, thing in us. And this is something that, that God taps into and God uh, helps us to see as we, we see this scene from Solomon's wedding, how the people respond, how the people respond to this. Um, and one of the ways they respond is with this idea, and you see that, that I, I've entitled this gospel lesson, My Tribute to My King, <coughs> Jesus. In Scripture and throughout history, there's been this idea of, of tribute paying tribute to somebody. And, and usually today we hear it at some like banquet for somebody who's been, you know, in, in this particular job or he's been a coach or he's been a, a leader for, um, for his life or maybe it's an actor and they're giving a, a, giving a, a, a life work um, Oscar or something like that. There's tribute paid to a person for what he's done. And in the Old Testament world and the world as we've seen through the that through history, there's this idea that, that this king that reigns over people receives tribute from his people. And even conquered people come and bring tribute. If you're familiar with the, the movie, The Ten Commandments with Moses, or sorry, with Moses, Charlton Heston Moses, same person. Um, with Charlton Heston. Yeah, Moses played Charlton Heston in that movie, you know. <laughs> with Charlton Heston, you know there's that great scene where people are coming before Yul Brynner playing Pharaoh and they're coming from all these nations and they say, we bring you the finest gifts from Ethiopia and, and they're just lined up as they come into the throne room bringing tribute to Pharaoh who reigns over even their nation. And, and so we saw this morning already like with First Kings uh, 4, I think it was, we were in, yeah, uh, verses 20 and 21, where Solomon was reigning over not only his own people, God's people, Israel, but also reigning over other nations. And these other nations would come and bring tribute to King Solomon, like the Queen of Sheba, uh, we see, bringing tribute to him. And in First Kings, I believe it's chapter 
chapter 8. And so we see this tribute going on as well at Solomon's wedding among his own people, and that we have this role in bringing uh, tribute uh, to our king. So our introduction there, if you'd like to fill out blanks in an outline, you're welcome to do that. Uh, we, we say here in our introduction, when a king is honored and praised by giving him gifts, thank you, O king, for your care and your protection of us. Thank you for your justice in our, the justice you provide for us in our land. Thank you for the soldiers you send out so that we're not conquered and damaged by foreign em enemies. Here is our tribute. Here's our gift. Here are our gifts that we bring to you. So this is called tribute. This is called tribute. We see it in Numbers 31. Uh, we see it in Samuel, or, uh, 2 Samuel 8, 1 Kings 4, 1 Chronicles 18, Psalm 72, which we read as our declaration of the gospel and, and uh, call to worship this morning. Okay. So about tribute. Uh, God says to us this morning through this passage as we, we look on and see Solomon's wedding, the, the wedding service of the son of David, what we're to do, and it's this. Okay, number one, give gifts, give gifts of tribute to adorn your king. We're to see this and understand this from this passage, that we're to be people who give gifts of tribute to adorn, to adorn our king, and our king is Jesus. Look in verse 10. Look in verse 10 down there in your Bibles. And, and now Solomon has made for himself the carriage, but you see that, that, that something's been made for him to adorn the carriage. And it's in the last part of verse 10. Its seat was upholstered with purple, its interior lovingly inlaid by the daughters of Jerusalem. That is God's people have had the daughters of Jerusalem, the people of Jerusalem have had this role to adorn their king. So that his wedding is all the more beautiful and, and uh, I want to say splendiful, splendid, splendorous, whatever. You know what I mean. So we give gifts to adorn our king, Jesus. A, okay, what kind of gifts do we give? Do we inlay, do we put rhinestones in, in the Shroud of Turin, right? No, not those kind of gifts. What kind of gifts does Scripture direct us are the gifts of tribute that we bring to him to adorn him? A, we uh, give Jesus the tribute, we give Jesus the tribute or the spiritual sacrifice of acts of obedience. Acts of obedience. And these acts of obedience are to his commands. And so we, we read about that and our, our, uh, dec our, our, our um, um, declaring of what we believe, our confession of faith this morning. Um, good works are determined by what God has commanded to be true. And so we look and say, you know, what, what has God commanded us to do? And we do these things. We give uh, this tribute by acts of obedience to his commands. And we see that in these various passages here. Um, and, and so we understand that part of our giving tribute is these acts of obedience. And each time we give an act of obedience, it's a gift. It's a gift to the Lord. But we recognize in giving, in the giving of this gift, uh, when we do something in accordance with his will, uh, that this uh, gift is like these daughters of Jerusalem uh, adorning this carriage. Um, we saw in Revelation chapter 19, verse 8, that Bob read for us, that those who are included in the wedding supper of the Lamb, those who are included in the wedding supper of the Lamb, also have this fine linen. Revelation 19, 8, and it says the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Now, these righteous acts of the saints haven't gotten them invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb, but having been invited and having been delivered into the wedding supper of the Lamb, having been brought to the wedding supper of the Lamb, we see that they have this fine linen, this symbolic show of their good acts, their righteous acts, the righteous acts of the saints. And this makes the wedding more splendiful, <laughs> more wondrous, more, more beautiful. And these acts of righteousness, these acts of obedience to God are also we see in Scripture sacrifices, or as Peter calls them in, in, in 1 Peter 2, or Paul calls them in, in Romans 12, 1, which we had read for us, 
spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Our righteous acts are never perfect. They're never done with perfect motives. They're never uh, executed in perfect fashion. But as we, we read in the summary from Scripture in our confession of our faith this morning, still Jesus mediates even our good works that we do, our acts of obedience, so that they're acceptable to the Father. But they are sacrifices. It's us doing things that otherwise we wouldn't do. And a lot of times, when we do what God wants us to do, it brings us persecution or trouble or criticism by others or at least chiding, or it inconveniences us to do the thing that God has said for us to do, or it causes us pain as we don't act in revenge, but we act in mercy and patience and kindness toward those who have harmed us. Those are all sacrifices, and Scripture calls us spiritual sacrifices that we make to the Lord, and we, we, we beautify when Jesus comes back, which is what Revelation 19 is about, when he comes back and the wedding supper of the Lamb is celebrated, it is more glorious because we come and we offer to him our gifts, our acts of obedience through our lives. And they give glory and honor to Jesus. And so that's why our individual instances when we're tempted to do what's wrong and we know what's right, when we say, I'm not going to do what I want to do, I'm going to do what Jesus has commanded me to do in the Bible. When we do that thing, what we're doing is we're gathering a gift, like another Christmas gift, to give to Jesus, or a wedding gift to give to Jesus. And we just stockpile these things through our lives. And that's why our obedience is important, or part of the reason it's important. And the first part is because it blesses us. It makes our life better. Our souls are blessed when we follow the Lord. We were created to walk in his ways. And so we're blessed in that way. But it's also, it, it also has this not me component, but it also has this God component. Every time we do a righteous act, we are adorning our king for his wedding ceremony. We're gathering gifts so that when he comes back, we got a whole set of rooms full of stuff to give to him, which are our righteous acts. Every one of them is a potential. Every time you're tempted and you do the righteous thing, or when you're not tempted and you're just doing the righteous thing by habit because God has worked that in your life, what you're doing is gathering another gift that you can give to your King Jesus, and you can't think of enough gifts that he deserves. He's that great. Say like we talked about last week. So our righteous acts are important because they, they adorn Jesus especially when we see him face to face at that wedding at that wedding supper b b so we give gifts of tribute to adorn our king righteous acts but also we give jesus the tribute of your life your whole life as a whole big picture paul speaks of pouring his life out as a drink offering. Those are the references there. A drink offering was a, a sacrifice, an Old Testament sacrifice, a drink offering where you took good wine and you just poured it out to the Lord. And, and it's like the, the, the woman who comes late in Jesus' earthly life. And Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's eating at the house of the Pharisee. And the woman comes in and she's notor a notorious sinner. And she recognizes the mercy of Jesus and the forgiveness in him. And she, she, in recognizing this, feels the comfort to be able to come to him and even to touch him. And she brings the most valuable thing she has and she pours it out upon Jesus' feet. Like a drink offering. The most valuable thing. And this is what we do with a righteous acts too. We're just gathering as much as we can to give to him. Gifts. But also our, our, our whole lives is poured out unto Jesus as a drink offering. And that's what we want to do. Our whole lives are, are, are to be just us pouring ourselves out to honor him. To bring him, to bring him tribute. So we see this in, in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Uh, live your life, bringing him spiritual sacrifices. Have your life be this, this <clears throat> sacrifice, this act of worship un, unto him. Um, 
Philippians 2, 2, Peter, uh, 2 Timothy 4 are both talking about Paul pouring his life out as a drink offering. And that's our tribute. Our whole lives lived for him. Uh, that is from our, our, our point of believing in him forward. And then C, uh, we give gifts of tribute to adorn our King Jesus. And C, we give Jesus the tribute of your praise. So give Jesus the tribute of your praise, your words, your expression of how great he is. Now, just public service announcement. Thanks is, is saying, God, thank you for doing this for me. Praise is saying, God, this is who you are, and it's awesome. Praise is declaring who God is. Okay, so, so if God's done something for you, give him thanks. But if you're just talking about how great he is, that's praise. Okay, God, you're the creator of the world. You're the redeemer of all who are redeemed. Okay, it's praise. You are patient. You are kind. You are loving. You are wondrous. You are powerful. That's all praise. And God calls for that. Uh, in Hebrews, it's called a sacrifice of praise. Again, this is our tribute, our sacrifice. Our tribute is praise. We praise him, give him words of praise. And that's what's being done here in this passage as you look, you know, verse 6 there. Look at verse 6. Who is coming up from the desert like a column of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and incense, and, and made from all the spices of the merchant? Man, he even smells good, our king. This is praise. It's exclamatory. Praise. And that's what we're, that's what we're to be doing. Uh, also, verses 9 and 10, look there. We say, look, and look at that carriage. King Solomon himself made that. You know he made that? And look at it. Look, take a close look. It's posts he made of silver. It's base of gold, the finest metals. This is how great he is. We give him praise. Okay, so we, we give him the tribute of the, our, our praise, our words of praise to him. Or as we saw at the wedding supper of the Lamb in Revelation 19.7, Hallelujah, let us give him glory. Words of praise to our great king, at his wedding supper. And so we do that as we are in uh, wedding supper practice every Sunday morning. Yeah, that's what this is, wedding supper practice every Sunday morning. We come and we give him words of, words of praise. First um, Peter 2.9, we use this a lot for our, our call to worship. Peter writes, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. Royal, royal priests offer sacrifices. They offer tribute to the great king, God. Uh, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may, why are you God's people? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Why are we the people of God? That we may declare his praises. So D, summary. Uh, adorn your King Jesus with gifts of tribute, which are acts of obedience, a life devoted to him, and praise. Now, two, we see something else here that's going on at this wedding ceremony, and it's this. God tells us to protect, protect Jesus' fame and his truth. Verse 7 there, what do we see in verse 7? Look, it is Solomon's carriage escorted by 60 warriors, the noblest of Israel, all of them wearing the sword, all experienced in battle, each with his sword at his side, prepared for the terrors of the night. These were guards for King Solomon. He was surrounded by his guards, and they, they had uh, swords at their side, and they were prepared for any attack against Solomon, even a, an attack that would occur in the middle of the night. Okay, so that's what's going on there. But for us, A, in your outline there, you as a Christian are part of the 60 warriors. That's what that looks forward to. We're part of the 60 warriors, the noblest of Israel, defending your king, Jesus. Um, Revelation 19, verses 8 and 14 uh, speak of us being clothed at the, the wedding supper of the Lamb in finest linen. Uh, we're this, this noblest of Israel. Um, we're the people uh, beside Jesus. We're the people who come, the armies of heaven, verse 14 of, of Revelation 19, who, who bear his testimony who hold to his testimony. We're the ones beside him. Revelation 9, uh, uh, 18 there, or sorry, 19, uh, 14 there. We're the ones wearing fine linen. 
it says there. And we're the ones coming beside him in glory. We're the ones fighting the battle alongside him. This great uh, uh, rider on a white horse, faithful and true, with this great, with this great crown. So that's who we are in this passage as well. We're the part of these 60 warriors. And so B, what does this mean for us today? What does this mean for us today? With God's word, we are. We're these warriors and we have God's word, which is our sword. God's word is our sword. So in verse 8, verse 7, it talks about these warriors, these guards around our king, the son of David, have swords. And what is our sword? Well, it's not the sword Peter had when Jesus was arrested. Peter had a literal sword, and he cuts off the high priest's ear, and Jesus says, put your sword away. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. There's a different sword we see in Scripture, and that's the sword of the, the word of Jesus. Jesus is pictured in Revelation as having a sword coming out of his mouth, which is his word. Um, we're told in Ephesians 6, 17 that Bob read for us that the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. And that's what we have. We have the word of God. This is the sword of the Spirit. And so we don't have a literal sword. And this is the mistake of the Crusades in the 1100s and 1200s, 1300s. The mistake of the Crusades, they took literal swords to expand Jesus' kingdom. But the scriptures tell us to take this sword of the word, Jesus' words, which he reveals to his people, and we use that sword um, for uh, his kingdom's sake. Okay? So with God's word, uh, we take his sword and uh, he speaks through us. See, so what do we do with his sword? Uh, we protect his fame and tr truth, first of all, in the church. So we protect uh, Jesus, we protect his truth, we protect his word uh, in the church. And uh, this is uh, largely, that's something done by elders. So uh, you're number one there. Elders are primary in this. That's the job given to them. So they need to be, elders need to be people who understand what the Bible teaches. And they guard and protect, they guard and protect the truth. Um, the church is the place, 1 Timothy 3.15, Paul calls the church the pillar of truth. That is the thing that supports the truth. A pillar supports, you know, a roof okay, or a ceiling. Uh, the church supports the truth of Jesus. Okay, so the church is to be this place of truth, and the elders are assigned this task of, of protecting the truth. And if error comes in the church, elders are to chase that error out. Uh, whether that's just uh, rebuking a person and, and having the person say, oh, yeah, I got it wrong, and the person stays in and rejoices at the good shepherding of the elders for him or her, or whether the person stays in his error and uh, is someone that gets chased out of the church. Um, that the picture here is, you know, uh, um, uh, of uh, uh, chasing uh, uh, error out of the garden as, as Adam should have done with the serpent, but he doesn't. Okay, so elders are put in charge of that. But even if elders don't do their job, number two there, as a citizen of God's kingdom, a church member, as we looked at in uh, Nehemiah chapter 8, you need to demand that your church leaders, your elders, are proclaiming and preserving the truth in the church. Because the church of all places on earth is the place where God's truth is. It's the, the pillar. It's the pillar of truth. And so, like the people said, Ezra, teach us from the word in Nehemiah chapter 8. That's what you're to do. That's what you're to expect from your church leadership. And if they don't preach God's word, if they are not upholding his truth, you demand that they do. And if they refuse to do that and there's no other recourse, find another church. Because that church needs to be upholding his truth. Um, so, be, two there, as a citizen of the king, God's kingdom, a church member, you're to expect, and if necessary, demand God's word be taught. God's word be taught in, in the church. Um, Acts 17, the Bereans, uh, Paul preaches to them, and they check the Old Testament scriptures to make sure what Paul was saying was true, and it was, and that's the way we're to be as believers. Okay, D, we also protect his fame and truth in the world. So we not only protect his fame and truth 
in the church or in Israel, like his guards did as Solomon was there living in Jerusalem. But also, we protect our king out in the world from, from foreigners out there. And how do we do this? Um, two avenues. First, first of all, number one, when the moral law, that's your blank, when the moral law is mocked outside the church, that is God's commands about how a person is to live, what a person is to do, how a person is to treat others, uh, how a person is to, to behave. Um, when, that is, when that is mocked and when uh, uh, wickedness, um, when wickedness is abounding and people are being hurt, uh, we're to speak up, and here's your blank, defending. Defending the logic, the truthfulness, and the sensibleness of our king's declarations, which are in the Bible. Okay? Um, so to the best of your ability, you do this. And you don't need to be an expert. It, it may just be you standing up at a PTA meeting and saying, you know, I just don't think this is right. I don't think it's right if we treat this teacher this way. Or I don't think it's right if we treat the students this way. And maybe that's all you can say. But you know what? There are other people typically who are sitting there who are kind of thinking the same thing. And maybe that'll give them, them courage. Or maybe that'll discourage the person who would be doing evil from leading the, the, the crowds, so to speak. But in this, here are some very critical things. Uh, first thing, A, attitude is critical. Attitude is is critical and the church fails miserably in the world on attitude when they speak up about things uh, uh, having to do with the moral law of God and how God has commanded folk people human beings to live and so here's our attitude number one um, you're to show gentleness respect and love toward those who are mocking God's moral law Somehow I got on a list for the NC Values Commission or something like that. Uh, they, they went on the website. They got my, they have my new email address, so they must have just pulled it from the website. And so I get this like every Friday, and they're upset with something that Governor uh, Cooper had done, which was a, a thing I'm not thrilled about. But uh, so they, they were saying, donate to us, the NC Values uh, Coalition, and for every $10, we'll send 100 dumb dumb suckers to the government um, to say we're not dumb dumbs and we understand what you're doing and so i sent an email back and i said i'm a pastor and the cause you're for i'm for too uh, but scripture tells us especially as we deal with governing authorities that we're to deal with them with honor and respect and with gentleness and we're not going to get anywhere with somebody, especially somebody who's mocking the, the moral code of God, if we just make fun of them and, and, and act, I didn't say this, and, and interact with them on the level of a middle schooler. Isn't this funny? We send them suckers. You know, how harmful um, that is. Fortunately, they're not speaking for the church in this. Um, they're speaking for the NC Values uh, Coalition or whatever that's that's called there. But I sent a very respectful email to this to this thing back. I don't know if it you know reaches anybody or not. If it's just off some big mailing list. But but here, here's here's why. Look at these look at these passages uh, here. First uh, Peter three fifteen. But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an, an give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. That's a command. If we are not gentle, if we're not respectful to the people to whom we're talking, no matter how badly they're mocking God and his moral code for human beings, we're sinning. If we're not doing this with gentleness and respect, because we're commanded to do it with gentleness and respect. Um, we're, we're, we're told in, in, in 1 Peter 2, 17, to honor the king. Uh, and, and so that's, that's what we do. But so attitude is, is, is very critical. Um, Mark 12, 31, love your neighbors yourself. When we speak up for the moral code of God, we're doing it out of love for our neighbors. And then 
Luke 23, 34 through 37. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at Jesus as he was up there on the cross. They sneered at him. They're mocking. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Ha, 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 ha. Verse 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. So when we stand up, if we have occasion for the moral law of God, our attitude is to be with gentleness, with respect, with love, with forgiveness, with recognition, duh, I'm a sinner. And if I get in a fight where we're pointing at each other's sins, I'm going to lose as much as he will or as much as she will. So we do this with gentleness, with respect, and, and with love. Um, number two, we're not to be condescending or pompous. We're not to be condescending or pompous like the Pharisees or like many Christians are today. So Matthew 9, 36, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were har harassed, they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. 1 Timothy 1.15 says, Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. What's Paul doing? He's calling himself a sinner who's saved. But Paul wants to make sure we get it. He says in the very next word, he says, Of whom, sinners, of whom I am the worst. That's Paul's attitude. Not pompousness. Not condescension. Not, you should be like me. I understand how to live. You're a sinner. Okay? It's no condescension. I'm, I'm the worst of sinners. When someone gets upset with us and says, oh, you're always trying to condemn people, say, well, I'm sorry you've experienced that from other Christians. Um, I know I'm worthy of condemnation. We, we just point it at ourselves. Um, we understand, like Paul does, and Paul says, I'm the worst of sinners. Paul's three statements like this in Scripture. Matthew 7, verse 1. Jesus says, do not judge or you too will be judged. If you're a person who's not going to be judged, here's how you act. Quit judging other people. Quit condemning them. And then he goes in, into his discussion about first pull the log out of your own eye before you take the speck out of someone else's eye. Quit condemning other people for their sins or as Paul says in Romans 2, when you do that, don't you realize that you're doing the same things? And so we always approach other people knowing that we're sinners and we have no foot to stand on to condemn them. Even as we stand for the moral law of God, we stand for the moral law of God with humility, with gentleness, and we stand for it because we love them. And we know that if they follow the moral law of God, it will be good for them. It'll be good for their family. It'll be good for their spouse. It'll be good for their coworkers if they follow the moral law of God. So when you encourage your coworker not to lie, it's good for him. It's good for your coworkers. It's good for your customers. And because you love all of them, that's why you're encouraging the person not to lie. Okay. So B, just quickly, motive is key. Motive is key. Um, so you want to defend your king, but with simultaneous love, for your neighbor to whom you're speaking. Okay, so we want to be really careful, really careful, because Christians do this terribly in our society today. Whenever we speak up for the moral law of God, what God has declared people should be like and what they should be doing, we need to be really humble. And if we think we're going to be uh, condemnatory, you know, maybe we just need to be quiet right now. And... and, and Go back and rethink our, our approach so the next time we handle it a little bit better. Okay. Um, second avenue of protecting the truth of Jesus, of using the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Uh, you're also to tell the truth of the gospel. You're also to tell the truth of the gospel. That's your number two there. Ephesians 6, 17 says that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And the Word of God is called by Jesus the gospel itself in, in his parable of the sowers. Um, he sows the gospel, which is the word of God, he says. 
and it bears fruit in, in good soil and, and creates new believers in him. But we're to tell the truth of the gospel. And right after Paul speaks of in Ephesians 6, 17, right after he speaks of the, 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 the sword of the spirit being the, the word of God, he says, and pray that I might declare it boldly and fearlessly as I should. Uh, Mark 4:14. 4, the farmer sows the word, Jesus says. This is what we're to be doing. We're to be not just having the sword, but we're to sow with it. We're to be using the sword, uh, with it, getting the gospel, getting the gospel out. Or Revelation 6:2. Uh, it describes Jesus during our era as being a rider on a white horse with a bow, and he's going out to conquer. Uh, Jesus has conquered most of us here. He's conquered our rebellious souls. And he's brought us to faith. And in conquering us, he hasn't put us in prison. He hasn't put us to death for being enemies of his, as Paul tells us we were in, in Colossians 1, 22, and 21, 22. But he conquers us and then makes us prized citizens with full benefits in his kingdom, the church. So this is what Jesus is doing. He's going out and he's conquering by his word. And he's not speaking audibly. He's speaking through our audible words, the gospel. So E, this avenue, that is the gospel over, the gospel over the moral law to non-believers is more important. Okay, so number two is more important than one. It's more important because in it, a person's eternity is at stake. Right? The first part, you know, if we speak up for the, the way people should live, you know, and they, someone decides to do that, um, that's great. But that lasts for a time, but it doesn't do anything for them eternally in terms of their eternal destination. But are speaking up with the sword of the spirit, the gospel, that can be something God uses to change someone's eternity. And that's forever. <laughs> You know it's a, a gray, rainy day when everything's quiet. So we share the gospel. We share the gospel and it affects people's eternity. And so if you have a choice ever between one thing or the other, and someone's sitting there and you know his ears are going to be closed because of some uh, disagreement he has with the moral law of God, but that he might listen to hear about Jesus, go with Jesus on that one. Because if Jesus saves him, all the stuff of the moral law will get cleaned up later. That's what Jesus is doing with us, right? He saves us first, and then we have his spirit by which he saved us. And then by his spirit, we can actually follow the moral law of God. When we bring up the moral law of God to a non-believer, it's kind of like hitting a brick wall. Usually the brick wall wins. All right, so uh, F, our primary battle as Christians uh, for uh, the expansion is for the expansion of the kingdom of Christ, not making the world nicer, not making the world nicer. If we can make the world nicer, great, but that's not, that's not Jesus' concern. It's not Paul's concern as he goes around and preaches. It's not Peter's concern as he goes around and preaches. Uh, making the world nicer. It, it's not. If it, can, if it can make someone's life nicer, great. That's loving your neighbor. Good. Uh, but that's not, the, that's not the goal. The goal is the expansion of the kingdom of Christ. Jesus' last words are not, now go make the world nicer. It's no. Matthew 28, go make disciples out of all the nations. Go make believers in me. And, and, and we're told in Scripture, this is your next line there, we're not to expect the world to change. Sorry if you thought it would change. Um, I mean, that's the, the bad news. Uh, don't expect the world to change um, much as we speak up for God's moral law. Uh, Matthew 24, 37, 39. Jesus said, when I return, it'll be like the days of Noah. How were people behaving in the days of Noah? So badly that he wiped out everybody but eight people. Jesus says, when the Son of Man returns, that's Matthew 24, when the Son of Man returns, it'll be like the days of Noah. And people would just be going about their own business, no care for me at all. Um, or 
Revelation 6, 12 through 17, it's the sixth seal. We're in the seals there in chapter 6. And Jesus says, okay, but when I come back, here's what it'll be. People will run for the caves and they'll say, oh no, the day of the Lord has come. And they'll hide because they know their judgment is coming. It's not like the song we'll soon sing in Christmas season. Um, uh, you know, let heaven and nature sing. Now earth receive your king. Earth sees our king coming and it runs and hides in dread because the earth is in such a terrible condition when Jesus comes back again. And so, so our, 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 if we think the world's going to get better by us declaring the moral law, Jesus says, well, no, you're, just, you're just wrong. You're just wrong. Um, people without the Spirit will behave like people without the Spirit. People who have rejected my law will reject my law and live and live like it. So don't expect the world to change much uh, as we mention God's moral law to it. Okay, now number three, just focusing on this, this gospel uh, expansion more. Number three, so tell others about him. Tell others about him. Evangelize, that is. Uh, we see this in, in uh, verse 8 and verse 11. Look at this passage here. Those who understand who Solomon is, those who understand his glory, his goodness, how he affects the nation and will affect the nation, like in Psalm 72. Psalm 72 says, when Solomon's king, the hills are going to be fruitful. And we're going to have flocks and herds like nobody's business. And the nations are going to submit to us and to him. And it's going to be glorious and we're going to be protected in our lives because we have a righteous king reigning over us in Jerusalem. That's what Psalm 72 is. And so in the so in Song of Songs in chapter 3, those who get who Solomon is and what a blessing it is and what it means that such a man would reign over them, what they do is call everybody else to pay attention. And that's, that's verse 8 and verse 11 there. Look at verse 8. They say... Uh, Sorry, that's not verse 8. It's verse 7. Look. That's the call. Look. Hey, look. And then verse 11. Um, Come out, you daughters of Zion. Uh, so, so it's this telling others about him um, to those, A, who aren't paying attention to him. We tell those who aren't paying attention to him about him. And so we say, hey, look. Look here. Uh, pay attention. Come out, you daughters of Zion. Jesus himself, Mark uh, chapter 5, verse 20. Jesus went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much, or no, sorry, this person Jesus had healed, the, the man with the legion of demons. He began to proclaim how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. Or John 4, 29, the woman at the well. What does she do when she understands in some sense who Jesus is? Um, she says, it says this, come see a man. This is what the woman declares to her, her city in Samaria. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And then verse 39, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony, which was, he told me everything I did, ever did. And then verse 32, then the people turn to the woman who's proclaimed Jesus to them, and they say to her, we no longer believe just because of the, what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. See, this is what we're to be about, proclaiming our great King as the Savior of the world. And so we tell those who aren't paying attention about him, we don't wait for people to ask about him. We say, hey, Daughters of Zion, get out here. He's coming. Look. And Jesus is coming. And he's coming for his wedding supper. That's the age we're in, where he's coming up over the hill. We can smell his incense because he's producing fruit all around us. And so we're telling people around us, hey, look, he's coming. The wedding supper is coming. It's going to happen, and you're going to miss out if you're just sitting in your house or about your other business and don't care about him. And so, B, what do we do? We invite them. That's B. We invite them. 11A, we say, come out, daughters of Jerusalem. And what do we invite them to do? Number one, to see his greatness. 
That's what 7, 7a and 11b uh, in the middle there is about. We say, look at King Solomon wearing the crown, the crown with which, with, which his mother crowned him, to see his greatness, and number two there, to marvel at him, to marvel at him, to acknowledge his greatness, um, so that people say, you know, wow. I thought Jesus was someone to avoid because he's going to take all my joy. Because he's going to tell me I couldn't do the things I wanted to do and, and make me do things I wanted to do and make my life miserable. But now I see him. Wow. To marvel at him. Uh, all those verses there from, and that's verses 6 through 11. It's all marveling at King Solomon. That's what's going on here. But then in, in Mark uh, 1, and, and forward, uh, Mark, and it goes on, I just quit. That's the, that's the deal. Jesus says this, and the people marvel. Jesus says that, and the people marvel. Jesus teaches, and the people marvel. Nobody's ever taught like this before. Nobody's ever cast this guy's demons out. In fact, we chain this guy with big, heavy chains, and he breaks out of them. The demons are so strong, and Jesus just tells them to get out of them, and they do. And the people marvel, and they're amazed. And that's a constant refrain in the Gospel of Mark, as well as some in the Gospel of Luke, too, that the people marveled. They were amazed. And that's what we're inviting people to do, to come and see Jesus to be taught about him, and then and then to marvel, to marvel at him. And then number three, and then as they come to marvel, of course, to believe in him, to believe in him, to take him as their king. They're like, wow. You know, imagine the King Solomon situation, you know, that somebody would be just there visiting in Jerusalem and would see Solomon coming up with the, the, the smoke and the carriage and all this stuff and his glory and his crown, and they'd say, my king kind of sucks compared to Solomon. <laughs> Can I just stay here? And the invitation of the Old Testament is absolutely stay here. The nations were to stream to Jerusalem. Okay? And that's what the church is to be, a place where people say they come in, they marvel. We say, hey, just come in. Just, just learn about Jesus. And that's what we can do as individuals. Even if we don't have the words to say to our folks, would you just come to my church for a few Sundays and you'll hear about Jesus. I just want you to hear about him. And our hope is they come to hear about him is that they'll marvel at him. And having marveled at him, they'll come to believe. And they, they'll say, I want to be a part of this kingdom. I go to this church and everybody's nice. Everybody likes each other. Everybody cares for each other. I, I just my ear, I hear these different conversations, and everybody's really glad to see one another. I don't see this anywhere else in my life, and I never have. And I heard about Jesus, and he's not who I thought he was. He's better. And so that's our desire, that they, that they come to hear about Jesus, they come to see him, they come to marvel at him, and then they come to believe in him, to take him as their king, and to be to be saved. That's your, your blank there on number three. To believe in him, take him as their king, and, and to be saved. Luke 4, 43, but he said, I must, must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns. That is why I was sent. Um, Acts 8, 12, but when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both women, men and women. And then Acts 16, 31, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Uh, that's our desire for people, as we love people, and as we want our king to be honored and glorified by people, that they would come to believe, and that they would be saved. And as they're saved, that they bring their, their family in too, to be saved as well. Um, so number four there, our last point, uh, to themselves, um, that they would uh, give Jesus worship, having come to rejoice in his kingdom. They would not only look around at everybody else rejoicing at Solomon coming over the hill, but they would actually join in in the worship. They would believe. They would, they would, they would identify themselves as, this is a great king and I want to be under him. And they join in in the praise of Solomon. And that's what a person does. As he comes to believe in Jesus, as she comes to believe in Jesus, they come into the church and they spend the rest of their lives giving praise to the son of David. Not Solomon, but Jesus. And that's the desire, that uh, people come in and they give honor and glory and praise to Jesus, that they start giving tribute to our king. So, conclusion, conclusion. Um, give tribute to Jesus. Give tribute to Jesus, protect and spread his fame and his truth.
protect and spread his fame and his truth. Let's pray.